Hello, and welcome to the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving GDAS webinar series. Before getting started, please remember that the link to the SurveyMonkey post test will be pasted onto the last slide. The post test will remain open for an indefinite amount of time. Please take it at your earliest convenience, though we encourage immediately following the webinar. Today's webinar will be Tips for Family Caregivers Learning New Strategies presented by Naomi Latini. Naomi Latini is the Training and Implementation Specialist at the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving at Georgia Southwestern State University. In this position, Naomi provides technical assistance and consultation to the RCI's Dementia Support Program sites, known as RCI REACH, as well as their Military Support Program, Operation Family Caregiver. Naomi holds a Master's of Science in Sociology from Valdosta State University and a Bachelor of Science in Sociology from Georgia College and State University. Since receiving her graduate degree in 2007, she has been an adjunct professor of sociology and women's studies at multiple universities and colleges around Georgia, to include Georgia Military College and Clayton State University, amongst others. Welcome, Naomi. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that introduction. I'm looking forward today to talking about tips for family caregivers and some new strategies that may be useful for family caregivers in their day-to-day -day caregiving journey. Before we get started with those tips um, and tricks of the trade, I want to remind you as a family caregiver that you are important. Sure, we're going to be talking about things that you can do for your loved one, but the simple fact that you're researching this alone shows how good of a job you're doing. So please take a moment to pat yourself on the back and recognize that you are important and you are valued, especially by us here at the Rosalind Carter Institute. I want you to know, first and foremost, before we start with tips, that friends and family provide support to over 90% of people that are receiving care at home. So if you ever feel like you're the only one in this situation and no one out there understands what you're going through, while your situation is definitely unique, there are millions of other people that are in very similar situations to yours. We'll be talking later on about how you might can connect with some of those people to help build a support system for yourself. I also want to point out that dementia caregivers report spending an average of between 16 and 22 hours per day providing care. This is important because spending that much time providing care definitely can lead to burnout. So hopefully what we want to do throughout this webinar is to give you some ideas of things that you might try that help, might help relieve some of that burden and may make some of your chores a bit more efficient so that you have a bit more time for yourself because certainly spending nearly 24 hours a day providing care to your loved one is exhausting. Hopefully some of the things you'll learn today will help. We're going to be talking about some common challenges that you probably have faced in your uh, caregiving journey. Rather than talking about some of the things that are more prevalent in discussion groups and things of that nature like um, bathing and, and eating, some of those common things like repetitive questions, things of that nature, I want to talk about things that are a little bit more intangible and maybe don't get quite as much attention as some of the others. With that being said, a lot of the tips that I'm going to be telling you about today are interchangeable with other problems as well. So even if one of these topics doesn't apply to your situation directly, I would encourage you to listen anyway because you may find something that's a tip for one thing that could help you with something else. The challenges that I want to talk about today, um, first is supporting the person living with dementia who refuses help. This is very common, and so we're going to discuss several things that you might can do to help ease the burden for you in this area. We're also going to talk about helping the dementia patient who lives alone. This is not an uncommon scenario and can cause great concern for the caregiver. So hopefully we'll have some tips to help there as well. We're also going to talk about long-distance caregiving. Just because someone may not live with the person they're giving care to, they may live several cities away or even several states away and in sometimes a different country. That doesn't mean you're not a caregiver if you're providing that care and advocating for your loved one. We're also going to talk about paranoia and suspicion. 
this is something that comes up regularly, but again, can kind of be embarrassing to talk about um, and can cause anger and frustration within families, not just with the care recipient and the caregiver, but with other family members as well. So we'll discuss that. We're also going to talk about shadowing, which is essentially when the person with dementia wants to be very close in proximity to their caregiver at all times. This also can lead to, to burnout very quickly. And then lastly, we're going to talk about intimacy. This is another one of those things that people can feel embarrassed talking about um, when it comes to a caregiving, care receiver situation. Um, but we're going to hopefully talk openly about it and maybe come up with some ideas to help you figure some of these things out. First, we will talk about refusing help. So what if the person with dementia is refusing help? It can be very frustrating when someone with dementia refuses your help, especially when there's safety concerns and you know that there are things that you could do that could help make their lives better. I want to point out that refusing help is not just something unique to people with dementia. This is sort of a cultural phenomenon where we want to be very individualistic and we want to be independent and we want to show everyone how strong we are. That's pretty common. It's not uncommon, as a matter of fact, for caregivers to refuse help, just the same as their care recipient might. So we know that this is kind of a cultural thing, but having that person with dementia refuse the help when they really, really need it can be especially frustrating. So if they refuse to let you help them, what can we do? First, you want to try to understand their perspective as much as possible. If someone has not received a diagnosis, it is likely that they recognize that they're forgetting things, might be forgetting words, they're misplacing things. You may have even pointed it out to them or other people might have. And so it can be very embarrassing to have to accept help from someone else because it would be sort of an admission if they were to do so. On the other hand, if they have received a diagnosis, oftentimes people will be in denial. And that's true of, of lots of different diagnoses that people might receive. So trying to understand where they're coming from when they're refusing your help may help you to have a bit more patience. Also, try to allow for independence as much as possible. As much as we want to step in for our mom or our dad or our husband and take care of everything because we love them so much, only taking care of the things that you really need to might actually be helpful for both of you because if they're still able to do certain tasks, then there's no need for you to take them over, even if they're not doing them the way that you would prefer that they do them. That kind of goes into our next bullet there, which is prioritizing their needs. If they're refusing your help, rather than trying to take care of their laundry, their house cleaning, meals, medicine, etc., think of what is really urgent and focus on finding ways to let yourself be able to do those things rather than trying to take care of everything all at once. This is especially true early on in the disease when they do still have maintain some independence. Also, try to use indirect approaches. Rather than saying, come on, Dad, it's time to take your medicine, which may make someone feel um, sort of, you know, like they need to be um, have their defense up, you could say, hey, I'm going to grab my vitamins now. I'll go ahead and get yours since I'm at the medicine cabinet anyway. Something along those lines that's a little more indirect and um, less forceful, a little more gentle. You can also try making your help offers your issue and not theirs. For example, if they don't want you to bring food over, you know, they say they, they don't need you to bring food, they can cook their own food. You might say, you know, I know you don't mean, I, I know you don't need this food, but um, it makes me feel so much better to be able to do something for you because I care so much about you and I just love cooking for you, so please, you know, for me, do this. You could do that with lots of with lots of different issues. So try and kind of turn it into something that's about you rather than something that's just for them. For doctor visits, if you are, you know, your loved one's going to the doctor and they either don't let you go back in the room with them or they don't let you go at all, or maybe you are allowed back in the room with them but they've asked you not to say anything to the doctor or you feel uncomfortable doing so for fear of embarrassing them or any other reason, 
If you're not their healthcare power of attorney, the doctor and nurses will not be able to give you any information perhaps, but you can certainly call and tell that doctor, you know, my loved one is gonna be there this afternoon and I know you can't share anything with me, but here are some things I'd like to give you a heads up on about what's going on with him or her. And that way they can take notes and have all of that in mind when they're speaking with them. This is important because especially early on in the disease and sometimes even later, People with dementia are able to, you know, kind of act like they don't have that disease for a short period of time. So if you're only in the doctor doctor's office for 15 minutes making small talk and answering basic questions, the doctor may never pick up on some of the symptoms that they're having. So giving them a heads up would be a, a great idea. Also, throughout the disease, using physical cues along with verbal may be helpful in getting your loved one to comply with the things that you want them to do. So let's say you're trying to help them take a bath and you say, come on, it's time to take a bath. They may have forgotten the word bath and they may not understand what it is you're asking them to do. So rather than you know, asking what it is you're talking about because they don't know how or out of embarrassment perhaps earlier on, it might be helpful to guide them to the bathroom and point to the bathroom, maybe be holding up a towel and shampoo, and then tell them it's time to take a bath. The same could be said with um, preparing meals. Rather than saying, come to the table, it's time to eat, that may be too much information for them to digest all at once. So instead, perhaps have the food prepared and bring it to them or point to it so that they can see physically what you're talking about rather than just having to understand and comprehend the words that you're saying. Lastly, if the person with dementia refuses help, you have to accept your limits and recognize that you're doing all that you can do. Like we said earlier, prioritizing their needs, making sure that the most urgent things are taken care of, sometimes maybe all that you're able to do, and that's okay, because that's all you can do at that moment. And remember to take a break when you need one. This is easier said than done, I know that, but it is important that your patience doesn't run thin with trying to take care of all of the things that your loved one needs all at once. And this will be true throughout each one of these topics that we're going to talk about today. Next, living alone. If the person with dementia lives alone, taking care of them can present a unique set of challenges. But there are some things that you can try that might not only lessen your stress, but increase the, both their safety and their quality of life. First thing that um, should be recommended is that if at all possible, get a power of attorney. This would be true for all of these topics. It's always good to have um, legal documentation to, to back up the care that you're providing. In a lot of states, the um, health care advanced directives that include both a living will and the power of attorney don't require um, don't actually require an attorney. You just need witnesses. So it doesn't, it's not going to cost you anything. You can find the forms online for free. So that would be um, an easy fix for that. Of course, for a financial power of attorney, you would need to get a lawyer involved. But this way, if you have these documentations, then you are able to make those phone calls, even if you're not there present when you're talking to their bank or to their doctor. You also want, when you're visiting, to make the environment as safe as possible. So this would include uh, fire alarms and things of that nature. Make sure that the doors lock. Make sure that there's no, um, preferably no rugs at all, but if there are, you know, um, they're safe and secure and don't have any ends bent up or anything like that. So try and make it just as completely safe as you possibly can. That would include, too, you know, handrails for the bathroom, things of that nature. You also want to, while you're there, clean out the medicine cabinet and organize their prescriptions. Many of us keep medicines for years and years in our medicine cabinet that's either expired or that we don't really need. And so for someone with dementia, you don't want them to have access to all of those different medications because they may take uh, uh, one medication and then 30 minutes later forget that they've taken it and take another and this could cause serious health problems. So clean out what they need, clean out what they don't need, and then also invest in a prescription organizer where you can organize what day and time they are to take those medications and have those laid out for them on a weekly basis. You also want to keep the refrigerator cleaned out. 
we want to make sure there's no expired food, there's no rotten food, and then keeping it cleaned out also helps it them to easily see what their options are. So you can help keep the refrigerator stocked with easy and healthy options rather than having it cluttered with some things that are in, uh, not edible. Consider in-home services or hired help. I know, you know, different people's means allow for different services, but oftentimes your insurance will cover at least some services, even if just for a temporary time. So it's definitely worth looking into because this will give you an extra set of eyes on having someone there, even if your loved one doesn't need physical help. So they might not need a nurse to come in. Hiring someone who's going to come and help clean up, even if it's just once a week, anything to help get, uh, like I said, an extra set of eyes there in the house. Also, try to utilize sticky notes. This helps for some people, especially early on, which is when they would likely be living alone, using a note you know, to identify where silverware is or where the remote control goes, kind of simple things like that. It doesn't have to be a sticky note. It could be a label or something of that nature. You can also use notes like on the door, for example, that says, if they're about to leave the back door, that says, don't forget, um, so-and-so is coming by at 4 o'clock today. So that may prompt them not to have to leave the house because they're reminded that you're going to be visiting later. So you can use those as kind of a message system as well as a labeling system. Visiting and telephone calls, I would say to try and create a routine, if at all possible, where you visit and call at the same time, um, every day or as often as you wish. And you could also have a note by the phone or again on the door showing when you're going to be doing that so that um, you have that communication in place and that kind of keeps things in a routine as well. Also consider an identification bracelet. Even if the person has not had any issues with wandering, it can be helpful just in the event of something coming up that they have identification that is on them. It could be useful in lots of different situations. Next, long distance caregiving. A lot of these tips are going to be interchangeable with the tips for um, if the person is living alone as well. We know that providing care from afar has a unique set of challenges, but with the technology, there are a lot of ways that it can be easier now than it might have been 10 or 20 years ago. So that's my first suggestion is to utilize technology. A lot of these other bullets kind of fall under that umbrella of utilizing technology. I, I would point out first here to consider a front door security camera. Those are actually not as pricey as you might think that they are, and they have several that the, when someone rings the front doorbell, a notification pops up on your phone showing you, um, you know, that camera that's right by the door. So you can kind of keep up with the comings and goings of others and for safety purposes as well. And depending on your loved one's level of privacy expectation, some caregivers utilize cameras that you might use in the home for um, if you had a nanny so that you can kind of keep up with certain parts of the house. Again, that would depend on the relationship that you and your loved one have and the expectation of privacy, but th that could be useful for safety reasons. Also keep up with where important papers are. Again, this would be good for any type of caregiver, whether it's long distance or not. There are lots of different templates online that you could find that kind of list out all the different important papers that you might need at any given time. So knowing where each one of those is can help you in the event of an emergency. If something urgent comes up, you're not searching around for where everything is. You know where not just things like a living will or you know any other advanced directive is, but even um, a deed to property. If they need to get something renewed, you might need to know where their birth certificate is. So that's going to keep you kind of um, more organized, and again, that would be true regardless of what type of caregiver you are. Also, find local resources and use them. 
I would recommend calling your local chapter area agency on aging as well as Alzheimer's Association and asking them what resources you might qualify for, your loved one might qualify for. There's often things out there that are not marketed or not marketed well that people just don't know about. So call locally and see what there is there. And that kind of falls into the next one, which is building a local care team. When people hear the term care team, I think often they think of doctors and nurses and medical professionals. Your care team is just anyone who is helping you to take care of your loved one, and that care is definitely on a spectrum. So this may include the neighbor of um, the person with dementia, whether you know them or not. You could, when you're visiting, stop by and give them a heads up to please look out for the house next door because you live out of town, et cetera. Maybe give them your phone number. So that could be a part of your care team. If your loved one attends church, maybe um, if they're comfortable with it and you're comfortable with it, sharing that you know, you're trying to provide care from afar and that if they could keep a lookout or maybe even stop by. Some churches have programs where they regularly do sort of well visits for, for people or you know, welfare checkups, checking on people. So that could be a possibility. It could also be close friends, family. It could be a home health aide, anyone, really. And there's lots of um, apps, if you, if you Google them, if you use smart technology, where you can actually link your care team all on one app together and take notes, you know, saw your mom today, she looked well, brought your mom lunch, or whatever it is that you wanted to share, all kind of in one place. So that would be part of that utilizing technology. Also, I would recommend keeping a care notebook. Again, there's apps and websites for this as well. This would be good for anybody with any diagnosis, but for you, especially if you're caregiving from afar or really even if you're living with the person, keeping up with medication changes, doctor visits, doctor recommendations, change in behavior, Etc. This is all going to be very helpful to you when um, there is some kind of change or when you do have to talk to a doctor or you're trying to get new services, that you have documentation of that, just simple notes. And again, you can find apps and websites to help you um, keep that organized. When you are visiting your loved one, reevaluate their care needs. So depending on how often you're there, a lot could change in a very short amount of time. So if you notice, you know, you were there three months ago and everything looked fine, but now when you visit, maybe things are a little bit messier and things aren't getting thrown away or the trash isn't getting taken out like it should, maybe now is a time to think about um, in-home housekeeping services or some, you know, something like that. That's just an example. So reevaluating what they need when you're there and really paying attention to if there are any behavior or um, memory or emotional changes in them or any environmental changes as well. Also consider joining a long-distance caregiving support group online. Again, this would be a simple internet search for this, and there's several of them. Some of them are live and meet at a certain time every week. Then there's others that are just a forum where you can go in and ask questions and, and share stories. You can also find Facebook groups if you use Facebook, um, Facebook groups that are just for this particular caregiving situation, again, where you share stories and tips with one another, and it kind of builds that sense of community for you so that you don't feel like you're all alone because there are millions of other people exactly in the same situation as you. Again, I'm going to keep reiterating this, but it's important to take care of yourself too. Just because you are caregiving from afar does not mean you're not a caregiver and it does not mean that you're not stressed in doing so. In fact, because of the unique set of challenges, you may feel even more stressed than you think you might feel if you were actually living there with them. So make sure that you are taking care of yourself as best you can and giving yourself that pat on the back because you are doing the best that you can do. Next, we're going to talk about paranoia. So what if the person with dementia suffers from paranoia? Paranoia is a common symptom associated with dementia and can make getting respite or having visitors a challenge. 
There are some methods, however, to ease the mind of your loved one, which in turn is going to increase your own quality of life. So if the person with dementia has paranoia, first recommendation would be to try not to take it personally. This is a very challenging, I know, especially if you are dealing with someone that you've had a, you know, a familial relationship with your entire life or near it, and you've always been kind and caring, and now they might be accusing you of, of something that you did not do. Um, that was kind of falls into them being suspicious. Paranoia and suspicion kind of go hand in hand. Try not to take that personally because it has nothing to do with you as a person. It is the disease that is causing the paranoia, not you. It's not that they think less of you or their feelings about you have changed. It's simply the disease. If you can remember that, it might help you to maintain some patience. Also, avoid arguing. This is not going to help anything by, by arguing with them because they're not able to think rationally about whatever it is that they're feeling paranoid and suspicious about. So I would certainly recommend that if um, you know, you're accused of something, I'm going to give you some tips here in just a second of what to do, but definitely not saying, no, I didn't do that, or you know, di being directly argumentative is not going to be helpful. You also want to validate their underlying feelings. This kind of falls into the trying not to take it personally as well. They go hand in hand because the underlying feelings with paranoia and suspicion are fear and insecurity. And so if we recognize what is appearing or exhibiting as anger as fear and insecurity, it's a little bit easier to not be angry with them. You can also verbally validate those feelings. If your loved one says, I can't find my wallet, did you take my wallet? You may can respond with, instead of arguing, you could say, I understand if you can't find your wallet, that's got to be very scary. Let's see if we can find it together, or something of that nature, so that you are validating the feelings that they have there. You can also try redirecting their attention. This could be true for any of these things that we're talking about, this are kind of behavior related as well. Um, so if they we're, go with the wallet example, think that someone has stolen their wallet, you could say that that's, sounds very scary. I would be concerned also if I couldn't find my wallet. Let's look for it together. Maybe while you're looking for it, you know, rummage in the drawer that has old pictures and say, oh, look what I see here. You know, here's a picture of, you know, distant relative or a trip from long ago, especially it would be ideal for that to be um, something that would be stored in their long-term memory, so several, several years ago that they remember that may help to kind of redirect them. You could also redirect them with, you know, okay, we're going to look for your wallet, but first let's go ahead and grab lunch or something like that to maybe try and gently nudge them in an opposite direction. If possible, it might also be helpful to keep a spare of important items. So if they have a you know, a wallet or a purse or something like that that's kind of generic, it might be helpful to have two of them so that if they think it's, it's lost, you can say, oh, no, you know, here it is. Um, this would be true for, like, house keys or, you know, anything that kind of is routinely, re reading glasses, anything that's routinely lost to have a spare so you can sort of instantly reassure them. So that might be helpful for items that aren't expensive. It might also be helpful to keep a log of both visitors and money um, or money transactions. The visitors, this could be for um, both paranoia, but also it could help with depression and just general forgetfulness because sometimes you may visit your loved one and they may say, I can't believe you haven't been here in three days, when in reality you were there that morning or someone else was there that morning. So if there's, by the back door, a log of who has come and gone and, you know, a blurb about what they did that day, you know, came by and saw mom brought lunch, something like that. So you can gently say, oh, no, see, I was here, you know, at this time earlier today. Some people find this to be helpful, and some care recipients even find it to be reassuring. If they're suspicious, 
or paranoid that someone's stealing from them, having a log of financial tra transactions might be helpful as well. So if they think someone has taken $20 from them, but in reality that $20 was spent earlier that morning, if you had written that down somewhere and even maybe had a receipt with it to say, oh, no, that's okay, it's not lost, we spent it on X, Y, and Z at the store this morning, that may be helpful and reassuring to get rid of that fear and insecurity that's bringing about that paranoia. If related to romantic relationships, meaning if you're in a spousal or romantic relationship and um, your loved one is suspicious when someone, of, um, someone comes over that they think might be a threat to their relationship, try to avoid being alone with visitors if at all possible. So maybe when someone else is going to come over, have two people come over rather than just that one person. This may help them to feel less like that other person is sort of a, a threat. Also, if all else fails, I would definitely consider talking to the doctor about what is going on because they may be able to make a prescription change or something like that that can help them um, kind of deal with this a little bit better. Lastly, if your loved one is paranoid or suspicious, remember that their feelings are unpleasant to them and they cannot control them. So all you can do is your best to reassure them. They don't, you know, if, if given a choice, most of us would not want to feel paranoid or suspicious. So remembering that they can't help it may help you to be able to cope with it. And again, if your attempts to lessen their paranoia don't work, I would recommend speaking to their doctor. And of course, speaking to their top doctor may be your first course of action if it's ser seriously interfering with um, your daily lives. Next is shadowing. So what if the person with dementia is shadowing the caregiver? If your loved one is following you around the house and becomes anxious when you leave the room, you can become very taxed, very easy. So let's explore some tactics to try and relieve some of this burden. If the person with dementia is shadowing, Try and take note of their underlying feelings. The same as with paranoia, remembering that they are shadowing you because they are finding comfort in you. You are their comfort system. You are what makes them feel comfortable and safe. So it's not done out of malice. It's done because you are their safe place. You also have to remember, just like with anything else, to give yourself permission to take breaks. This can be challenging when someone is shadowing you, but is nonetheless important. Even 15-minute breaks is better than none at all. One way that you may be able to do that is by finding meaningful activities for your loved one that require their attention. This could be something like um, sorting laundry. Even if they're not going to sort it correctly according to your standards, if that was a routine they did in the past, that may keep them occupied for a few minutes so that you have a breather. Also, consider things like snacks. That's, that's down below there, but sometimes providing snacks that require um, kind of concentration, like dipping something into a, you know, a sauce or um, chips and dip or veggies and hummus or something like that, that kind of requires them to do something and is a finger food. Some caregivers think that or feel like that helps them to kind of stay busy for a few minutes. You can also try establishing a routine. So a routine makes anyone feel comfortable to know what's coming from day to day. So even though you may feel like your loved one is not aware of the routine that's in place, trying to have one is certainly not going to hurt anything to see if it actually kind of does help them to feel a little bit more comfortable. So if they know that every morning at 8 you're going to take a shower, but every day at 8.30 you're going to be out of the shower, they may be less inclined to want to follow you into the bathroom um, or into your bedroom while you're getting ready, things like that if you do have a routine. 
You can also try making a recording of your voice. So this may sound crazy, but again, think you are the person that is their safe space. That's why they're shadowing you in the first place, because you make them feel safe. So if while you're taking a shower or while you're, you have to be away, you had a recording of you, even if it's just reading a story or telling a story, something like that, um, playing in the background may make them feel safer. You can also try soothing music through headphones. When um, you have headphones on, it kind of takes all of your attention because it's, it's sort of eliminating that one sense except for the music that is playing. So you could try soothing music or um, music from decades past that might have been during their youth that they would find joyful or relaxing, maybe gospel music. So trying music with headphones will eliminate background noise and kind of overstimulation and may help them to feel calm and comfortable. Also remember that they're shadowing you because you comfort them. Again, they're not doing it out of malice or harm to you, although it may feel like, you know, that they're that that may not be the case because it can be so frustrating to not have any time to yourself. That's not the case. They're not able to control those feelings and the way that they come out is by wanting to be near you all the time. So hopefully some of those things can help ease both their mind and give you a breather. Our last topic is intimacy. So what if you're struggling with how to maintain care how to maintain intimacy as a caregiver and a spouse? Intimacy is a normal and healthy part of any relationship, regardless of whether it's spousal or not. But it can bring about confusing feelings after a, a diagnosis, and it also can be uncomfortable to talk about. So if you're wondering about intimacy, remember when we talk about intimacy, there's not just one thing that we're talking about. Intimacy is really just feelings of emotional closeness. So remember that there's not any one correct answer. What's okay for someone else and what they're comfortable with is not going to be the same that you are okay with and that you are comfortable with. So that leads to our next bullet is that what you should do is consider what you're both comfortable with. The reality is that you are an expert in your caregiving journey and you're an expert in the care that your loved one needs, as well as what you need yourself. So consider what it is that you need and what you feel comfortable with. Also know that warmth and tenderness go a long way. So regardless of your level of um, physical or emotional intimacy, holding hands and caressing hands, um, combing hair, even an intimate meal spent together, those are all ways to be intimate, which kind of all of this sort of falls in together because this next one is the same. You know, f find alternative ways to be intimate. If for physical, um, emotional, or cognitive reasons, you're no longer able to express intimacy in the ways that you have been in the past, consider different ways. Again, we're just looking for that feeling of emotional closeness. And so there's, there's lots of different ways, unique ways, that you may be able to find that. Also remember to consider your own needs, that um, if you are feeling lonely and like you're not getting that emotional closeness, there are different ways that you could consider making that a bit better, which is the last point here, that you may want to seek guidance from other people when you have unanswered questions. I've already mentioned that there's lots of apps and online support groups that you could go to if you don't want to go to one face-to-face. -face. You could also, I would strongly recommend, finding a support group locally if there is one. So again, seek out your area agency on aging as well as your Alzheimer's Association to find out what is available <clears throat> there for you in that arena. And if there's nothing available there or you don't want to talk to anyone else about that, talk to a close friend, you know, and 
invest uh, the time and energy to do that because they probably are, I'm sure they care about you and they would love to be able to provide guidance if you ask for it, even if someone has not been in the same situation as you, because no one is going to have been in the exact same situation. Still, you may find help by reaching out to others and see if anyone has ideas for you. So that's it for our um, tips and tricks for common challenges. A couple things to leave you with. Please remember that as a family caregiver, just as I said in the beginning, that you are important and you are valued. By taking the time to even listen to this, you are trying to be the best caregiver that you can be for your loved one, and that is impressive and it is valuable. And so if no one has told you that recently, please know that um, we feel that way, um, that you are doing a great job and should be proud of yourself. If you are interested in more information about any of these topics, or anything else related to caregiving, you can reach out to us at the Rosalind Carter Institute um, via phone, email, our website, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and now also Instagram. So all of that information is there. If you would like more information about this or any of our other free caregiver support programs, please reach out to us because we are here to help you. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you so much, Naomi. It was such a pleasure to hear your tips for family caregivers. Thank you. Remember that the link to the post test is pasted on this slide. Um, please take it at your earliest convenience. Please also remember to view the other webinars in the RCI GDAS webinar series. Thank you so much, and please join us again.